Hi, everyone. My name is Jordan Tabor. Uh, I'm an engineer at Booz Allen Hamilton, um, as well as a material scientist. Um, so at Booz Allen, I sit on um, the digital battle space team, which works on delivering um, smart technologies to the joint force. Um, and my background, as I mentioned, is in material science. Um, prior to joining Booz Allen, I got my PhD at NC State in polymer science and electrical engineering. And prior to that, worked on my um, bachelor's in textile engineering. So while working on my PhD, I focused on um, developing textile-based flexible sensors for um, health monitoring within prosthetic devices. So today I'll be focusing on um, the technology that has been um, developed in the textile-based sensing space or the textile-based electronic space. And Maggie will um, touch on all the fun data side of things. So with that, I'll hand it over to Maggie. Thanks, Jordan. Um, hi, all. I'm Maggie Corey. Um, I'm from Booz Allen Hamilton's Bright Labs group, and I'm a senior lead data scientist. I look over our innovative products work. Uh, Bright Labs is Booz Allen's technology research and development organization. We leverage the rapid evolution of technologies to reshape the needs of our clients um, supporting their mission. Uh, this includes our accelerated readiness and human performance and sports science thrusts. Uh, through working in this space um, uh, and just personal experience with wearables and wearable tech, um, I can understand how to enable us to understand more about the human as a system, as we like to call it, um, and how that data can be utilized to better understand us, to understand others, um, and ultimately move from um, that descriptive experience to a more predictive experience. Uh, and with that, I'll hand it back off to Jordan. Sure, so um, I wanted to quickly start off with a quick overview of um, textile-based electronics and, and what I mean by that. So at a very basic level, like uh, when we talk about wearables, we're talking about any kind of electronic device that can be worn on body. Um, so most traditionally people think of these as like rigid devices, like smartwatches um, that can sense your heart rate. Um, however, there have been a lot of different types of devices that have been considered for wearable electronics, things like um, actuators or mobile power devices. Um, so in addition to these wearable devices taking many different electronic forms, they also take on many different form factors. So um, in recent years, there's in, in the recent times, there's been um, growing interest in how these electronic devices can be embedded into fabrics um, to allow for a more unobtrusive integration of this technology. So that's really a lot of what I focused on um, in my PhD and beyond. Um, but at a very basic level, textiles are, you know, materials that are produced by intermingling fibers or yarns to provide a fabric structure. And these are generally produced things through uh, methods like um, knitting, weaving, or non-woven fabric production. Um, so in this way, textiles are hierarchical structures um, with the most basic unit being a polymer. Um, polymers are used to make fibers, fibers to yarns and yarns to fabrics. So over the years, uh, researchers have really looked at how um, all of this different technology can be um, best um, integrated into these different levels, whether that's polymer, fiber, yarn, et cetera, and uh, how that can be done to provide the most unobtrusive uh, means of uh, wearable device integration. Um, so while the means of producing and integrating this um, textile-based technology is really important, another really important aspect of this is designing how data and um, you know, power will be transferred and uh, how the data will be utilized. So it's really important that while we're designing these devices, I, I'm working with people like Maggie who can um, inform how data is properly used and um, made useful. So with that, I'll hand it back to Maggie to talk about uh, the data usage a bit on the, oh, uh, actually, sorry, I have a little bit more to say. Um, so looking at the applications of wearables and how they're used, um, textile-based sensors have been used in a lot of different applications, um, like sensing. Um, most often we see them used for strain and pressure sensing. Um, but uh, in recent years, we've also seen a lot of researchers try to uh, expand the sensing technology beyond just pressure and strain into more advanced stimuli like temperature and chemical sensing. Um, other trends that we've seen in this space is really around um, trying to sense at not such a macroscopic level. So 
um, really early on in the field of textile-based sensing, we saw a lot of people taking commercial devices and basically kind of just sticking them onto a garment. And, and um, while this did provide a proof of concept in the recent years, um, researchers have really been more focused on trying to figure out how we can integrate these at a more microscopic level so that these devices are better integrated and um, less obtrusive. Um, so with that, um, I'm going to hand it over to Maggie to talk about the data side of this. Thanks. Um, so yes, yeah, so as Jordan has alluded to, we can now collect data from multiple aspects of systems. These, these wearables, this, these textiles, we can start to understand more and more about the body. Um, and so this can be internally focused with glucometers, um, heart rate to understand physical aspects and physical fitness. Uh, within head-mounted displays, looking at eye saccades and eye movements to understand focus, um, or even monitoring our sleep overnight. Uh, lots of wearables um, in the sleep prediction race. Um, this can all come together to understand a more, uh, a larger picture of stress, of readiness, of health, and these data streams um, and calculations create a picture of us as humans. Um, we can understand if we're at peak performance, if we're lagging, if we're behind. Um, and ultimately, that situational awareness is so powerful. It helps us achieve our goals. It helps us under it helps us understand where we're at in business needs. Um, and so, to mention just a couple of my favorites. I'm a big golfer, so when Whoop partnered with the PGA, um, I know that they were originally looking at respiratory rate to predict COVID, um, but we can also see how heart rate of these players um, change during a golf match or even through training, and that really helps them um, in training. Uh, that helps. Heart rate is a great indicator for training and to enhance training and to understand how people are moving throughout training, whether that be in the DOD and the government or in uh, professional sports. Um, I think a lot about marathon runners. I talk to a lot of my friends who are now marathon runners and, and how they can have AI now tell them when or how to train. Um, a lot of my friends, they always said, oh, my Sundays or my Wednesdays, they were my long run days. Um, but now they do their long runs when they're in peak performance. They understand when their body is ready for that increased strain, that increased stress. And that also helps for rest days. Um, I think a lot of times athletes, um, we see a lot now with professional sports, you know, these coaches and these data science teams that are embedded alongside uh, these professional sports teams, they understand when people need rest. They understand when they could injure themselves or um, they could do more harm than good by trying to go out and do their typical training. Um, I think also a lot about what time to train. Uh, there is there is some discussions around morning workouts and if that actually creates more harm to people who aren't used to morning workouts. Um, lots of research out there that I could talk forever about. Um, but I will also mention one more thing around eye trackers um, and this being big in the metaverse um, by tracking eye movements during taskings or trainings or otherwise. Uh, we can utilize AI, the processing of those eye movements and those eye saccades and, and where we're looking um, to understand focus and attention. Um, this could have potential applications in education. Um, are people able to focus? Um, but also day to day, when do we need to take a break? When when should we come back mentally refreshed? Um, and so just to talk a little bit more about AI, um, I think the evolution of wearables and wearable tech has enabled a new type of AI. And as a data scientist, I'm really excited about that. Uh, there is uh, so much more um, compute power on chips within wearables on AI. I mean, Jordan has mentioned some of this. There's so much more power. There's so much more. There's so many more ways that we can communicate and bring in data. Um, and those can run pretty complex algorithms directly on the device or otherwise. Um, so by now having the technology to utilize and, and process those large streams of IoT, uh, we're seeing a large movement of the amount of training data we can utilize for AI. Um, and that is coming from hopefully really diverse populations that can feed back into really powerful predictions. Um, so I hate to use the COVID example again, but if you look at what Aura and Whoop did um, to accomplish the prediction of COVID, being able to wake up and say, hey, you may have COVID, um, understanding what other users, um, what, what their body reactions were during COVID can help you know, predict and support um, you know, new users and, and the larger population. 
this brings up a really great, you know, great aspect around alerts. Um, we can see this for the diabetics with glucometers, um, wrist-worn wearables, um, predicting seizures. Um, health benefits of alerts like this are really powerful, and it's all from AI, but also from the data that we can collect from these wearables. Um, on top of that, I'm really excited about time series classification machine learning algorithms, um, moving beyond just, you know, a prediction, but hey, this is a time series component here. We're looking at things over time. Um, and so we can see this with sleep stages, being able to look over our sleep sessions and, and have an algorithm classify when we were in REM, when we were in deep, when we were light, when we were in awake. And that helps us understand how we slept, not just how long, you know, but also our readiness for the day after because of that. Um, prediction of fatigue, uh, utilizing large, scalable, non-relational databases that can correlate and aggregate multiple streams of data uh, to better understand fatigue, taking multiple components of IoT. Um, and I'd also want to mention our new abilities to understand movement and acceleration um, to predict form in athletes or just general people. Um, that also helps us understand musculoskeletal injuries. Um, I think immediately of Plantiga out of Canada. Um, they have shoe inserts um, that understand force and movement of runners um, that can help us understand, again, form and create better training um, and also better uh, habits. Uh, even for baseball pitchers, looking at movements, um, the way that a body turns, um, how they move their arms, are, is that movement creating stress on muscles and joints? Can we create new habits so then uh, somebody is not injured as easily? Um, and lastly, an important component of AI is the deployment. It's great to have all this training data. It's great to be able to get all this data, but um, cloud has been obviously a phenomenal resource uh, for many reasons, uh, for the consolidation of this data, for the ability to train really, really complex AI models, um, but also moving towards edge compute. Uh, edge is something that I'm really excited about. So I now see that there are hubs. Uh, a lot of uh, these, you know, there's there's pucks and whatnot that can be utilized for athletes as they're training. Um, and this data can be processed with extremely low latency, right at the edge, get insights really quickly, and that doesn't even have to touch a cloud. With that, I'm gonna pass it back to Jordan. Thanks, Maggie. Um, so we wanted to just spend some time talking about the challenges and the ethical considerations around um, wearable electronics or, or smart textiles. Um, so from my perspective, being a material scientist, um, you know, a big challenge in the smart textiles or electronic space is um, producing these devices with materials and processes that can be easily transferred um, to the textile um, you know, market. Um, so things are really valuable uh, proof of concepts in the lab. But, you know, when you're looking at scaling it, um, making sure that the materials and the processes used to produce these devices can really be scaled up to make these devices more impactful. Um, another big challenge we see in this space is around power. So, um, you know, in many cases, uh, we can make these devices really cool and really flexible and, um, you know, uh, provide some really compelling use cases, but um, in a lot of cases, the power kind of lags behind um, because there aren't a lot of great flexible power sources out there at this time. So um, that's been a challenge in this field, um, as well as the means of connecting to that power source. So um, interconnects is a really big challenge in this space and having those be um, robust and um, easy to use. Um, another thing is just the ease in, of use and care of the devices themselves. So while uh, there have been a lot of really cool smart textiles that come on the market, um, how they're cared for, i.e. how they're washed and how they're used has been a really big challenge. And in a similar kind of vein, um, having people ensure that they wear these devices properly to uh, make sure that the data that collect is collected is actually reliable and accurate is a big challenge. Um, so just a few of the things that still need to be uh, worked out in this uh, field and, and um, definitely will take um, collaboration. So uh, with people like myself and Maggie, so with that, I'll pass it to Maggie to talk through some of her challenges in her space. 
Yeah, it's a uh, that's such a phenomenal point, Jordan, too, on on how we wear this type of these types of wearables to make sure that we have the right types of data, even if you know you can't fully grab an EG. Um, it's I think it's it's important. So with that, I think also data protection will be huge. Uh, we're collecting a lot of information on a human, and while I want to know a lot about my body and my strengths and my weaknesses, um, I don't want at somebody else to know a lot about that, especially if we think about the applications to soldiers or athletes, understanding where they're improving. Um, a competitor would not, we wouldn't want a competitor to know that. Um, also bias in AI is prevalent too. Uh, we train a lot in wearables and what is the divide between uh, genders and ethnicities in that training data set? Um, are we able to accurately predict for minorities? Um, are we seeing historical bias where initial models were trained on athletes and now uh, you just have me coming in and hoping that I can get some pretty good predictions as well? Um, will there be data drift as that population grows? It's really essential to continue to evaluate the data that goes behind these AI models. Um, and then also multiple wearables. We've talked about that. A lot of times they're in silos. I know that my team is working on the consolidation of that data into a single picture taking you know, data streams from very different wearables with very different APIs. Um, I know that there's a few available uh, solutions out there that can combine that data for the same. Um, I'll pass it back off to you, Jordan. Yeah, I know we're almost at time and I wanna leave space for questions, but uh, Maggie and I just wanted to highlight a few future trends. So of course, smaller sensors, better integrated sensors, um, things that, from the textile space are less obtrusive and really provide that seamless means of sensing and um, any type of device, uh, really seamless integration. And of course, power harvesting, how can we um, improve the whole power issue and um, how can that best be addressed? So I don't know, Maggie, if you have any high level yeah. future trends you wanna highlight. Better compute, faster data access, um, better communication protocols, Bluetooth is okay. 5G has been really awesome with lower latency, higher amounts of data that can be transferred, much stronger security. Bluetooth is not very secure. Um, yeah, so I mean, I, I can give my quick conclusion here. Data is becoming so powerful. We're having you know, that interest in utilizing that data um, beyond just steps, but just to be prepared about you know, myself today and what is my body telling me.